message tonight um, is called Imperfect Rest. And so we're going to look at several different things tonight. So um, I'm going to skip around a bit. I'm going to be beginning with um, a passage we're all so very well familiar with. But I'm going to read a few verses of it. Um, and it's from John 8. And it's, you all know, it's the adulterous woman. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives early in the morning. He came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him. And he sat down and began to teach them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Women, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. And so while I was waiting with the Lord, meditating on that passage, um, he began, began to unfold what I'm about to read to you. So just receive this. This is nothing to take notes on. This is just to receive. And what he said to me was, I didn't answer them. Jesus didn't answer them. Religious law keepers screamed in his grace-filled ears. He refused. He chose not to respond. He bent down. He wrote with his eternal finger in the dust. Dust that he had shaped mankind from. Religion shouted, demanding answers to their questions. Tell us, what do you say we should do with her? He remained silent. No one can force I am to respond. Certainly not spirits of condemnation, nor anger demanding another human sacrifice on the altar of legalism. Jesus stood up in the very midst of the sounds of accusation. His very standing in the midst of demonic spewing disrupted its swirling intent. He intentionally looked right at them into their eyes piercing truth looking to see was there any light of grace or mercy within their souls as the divine protector of the ones he left heaven for he speaks let's have the man who has never had a sinful desire throw the first stone at her never and never and never and never and never echoed around their hardened hearts and demonically filled thoughts and like lightning flashing exposed the stark reality they were all guilty none were innocent all required stoning jesus chose to let truth ring its resounding chorus and silence the accuser so he bent down again and wrote some more in the dust he created the very dust who knew who he was. All of creation knew and watched. Conviction sound resounded in the atmosphere like a quick moving thunder cloud. It swallowed up the law and released grace and mercy. Let him, let him, let him, let him, let him who has no sin echoed around the courtyard. A thunderous voice of jealous caring and compassion silenced everything and everyone. In the silence of that moment, 
the thud of the rocks of the murderous spirit, religious spirit's plot hit the ground, releasing the sound and the sentence of death was nullified by the sound <coughs> of holy conviction from the Lamb who chose to come. He was displaying before all to see and hear that day the very reason he came. And man's choices were displayed. All were gone now. Stillness was in the air. Grace is hovering like a blanket of mercy to clothe a naked, shame-filled daughter with dignity and hope. He stands up a second time with the voice of the true shepherd and asks, Dear woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one here to condemn you? The divine, eternal question, where are your accusers? Accusers, 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 accusers. The demons panicking, no one is left. They are now stricken from this arena. They had thought was a well prepared, they were well prepared for another sacrifice of a beloved child of God. Is there no one here? She looked around, stunned. She had waited the blows of burial stones. Instead, she heard thunds, but too afraid to even peek, she now chooses to look. Wide-eyed, openly, to look around, and still not able to fully comprehend, I see no one, Lord. No one, no one, no one, no one. Who could silence such a crowd? What could cause this death parade to seize its march and surrender its demand? Only mercy himself. Lord, he alone, the Lord of mercy. The eternal lamb stood in her midst and declared her free and not guilty. It rang from eternity. He was slain before the foundations of the world. And now, supernaturally, suddenly, resounds in this now <laughs> moment of time. He speaks for the final time in this epic drama before heaven and hell. Then I certainly don't condemn you either. Go, and from now on, be free from a life of sin. I don't condemn you. Go, from now on, be free from a life of sin. I don't cancel out sin's demand of a price to be paid. Go breaks the chains of sin's captivity that would want to hold her and fasten her to her past, to limit her moving in a minuscule circle of if only, if only, if only, if only, and the shame of the past, rehearsing with the demons of remorse, her life a waste and a total loss, but saved this time. The demon screaming, we will have an opportunity again. You'll be back, and so will we, and the next time, who will save you? Ah, but the eternal one's voice continues, from now on, be free from the life of sin. I am the one who this day declared, you are safe within our arms, abide there, for we clothe you with forgiveness. We adorn you with hope. We fill you with rest. Breathe in the atmosphere that now surrounds you because perfect love casts out all fear. Everything that he did was in perfect rest. Everything that he did was in perfect rest.
and as And you just see this eternal embrace of this woman. Wrapped in mercy and grace. As he has come to each one of us when we were accepted him as Lord. And he wrapped us in his arms. As a father, we became sons and daughters. In the arms of Jesus, our Savior, our one day bridegroom, our King, our Lord. He is rest. He didn't just walk in it, but he is perfect rest now. And I'm going to read something um, from his name, the best I can say it is Chaim Bantara. Bantara, I believe is how you say it. Chaim Bantara. And I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he had gone away on a private retreat to a um, a place where it's a silent retreat place. There's no speaking at all. There's no words spoken. And so he was at this place of retreat seeking to get away with the Lord. And he sought a place that was, you know, away and really removed. And in this whole time away, he wrote a book from this, and it's from that book. Um, but I'm just going to read the end part of what he writes. This is God's week. My week in the wilderness, my week in the place that's like removed, where there is a flow of the Spirit of God that I do not want to interrupt. And he talks about, so what should I do? Maybe the same thing a couple does in their honeymoon or their second honeymoon, when after a day of sightseeing, eating out and walking along a beach, holding hands and talking, they have run out of things to do and say, so they just settle down and hold each other, not saying a word. Perhaps now is the time for God and me to just hold each other, not saying a word. Simply enjoying each other's presence. The ancient sage Jewish sages called it devek, a clinging to God, a hugging of God, a letting him hug you. You don't need to express a word. You can just rest in the embrace. And that's what struck out to me when I first read this that invitation that he always gives us, just rest in my embrace. And that's not just like sitting. There is, that, there is this time of our own little retreat with him, whether we go off to retreat or our daily time with him before we start our day or, or end of the day, in the middle of the day. But it's not just that place of being with him in those moments like that, but we get up from that place and we walk through our day in rest. We remain in that embrace is where I'm going. Because so often, you know, we can have a vacation or we can have time away, but what happens when you come back to, if you will, real everyday life and your everyday schedule? That's really the test, is it not? That's really the litmus test of how much of his rest really entered into our being? Did we go deeper? And I believe that this is really the invitation that he's speaking louder than ever, particularly at this time on earth where there is as so much calamity, so much chaos. And we're not to be unaware of it. We're not to be uninvolved with praying and all of that. But we must do it from gazing there having ourselves deeply in a place of rest so we can look at the chaos and not be moved. So that even when we pray, we're praying from rest, not from striving and all this stuff, but from a place of deep-seated rest. 
you know, uh, Rick Joy and I'm going to share a couple of things from, about, from him here. He talked about how God walked, God walked with Adam, but God is living in us. Often we say we want to go back to the garden, but you know, we have him living in us. Adam didn't have God living in him. He met with him. We can both meet with God and he's in us. And we know we were created for his pleasure. We know we were created from that for fellowship. And the whole reason of redemption, we know, is the restoration of that relationship. It's the intimate friendship with God. So if that was God's purpose, then that needs to be our purpose of our life. Correct? Like if we created something for a purpose, would we not want it to be used for that purpose? Is that not true? And so he created us for that purpose. And in the enemy's greatest victory, besides hell, for those who go to hell, his greatest victory is this, keeping, in his eyes, is keeping Christians from intimacy, from walking and talking and communicating with God. That's his, he is so thrilled with that. He rejoices and all of hell rejoices when we don't have with our creator what he created us for. This is the enemy's goal. And do not think for a moment it's not. It's separation. Whatever he can do to separate us from God. If he can't separate us eternally to be with him in hell, do you follow what I'm saying? Then... I'm gonna, he's going to do his best with every distraction and everything that he can to keep us from being in an intimate place with God. The goal of God is for us to be his temple, for us to be his true friends, and that his glory would be manifested in and through our lives. See, everybody's running around, everybody's trying to figure out what their call is. This is our call. And anything he asks us to do, specific assignments and destinies come from this place. And oftentimes, destinies don't come forth because he will not allow us to run before that. He says, you must be established in me, or I can't trust you with the fullness of what I created you for. So the real warfare always is about intimacy and seeing his majesty. So, as he writes, all this, these are all, this is all from Rick Joyner, the measure of true Christianity, and I know I've said this before, how close, how close to God we really are, and how much of his glory is manifested in our lives. And that can't be passed on from somebody else. That's from our time with him. And so, in the end, as he writes, God will have a people who walk with him, and he is their passion. And so, I, I just, you know, I've always loved Rick's teachings on that. I'm going to share something else. And this is from Rick, Mike Bickle. And this is from a book he wrote many years ago. But real truths are forever. Follow Sam, when the Lord shows mysteries from heaven, they're forever. And so Mike Bickle wrote this. To know the emotions of God's heart is what will equip you to obey his commands. To know the emotions of God's heart is what will equip you to obey his demands. His commands, not demands, commands. David wanted to know the why of God. He knew the what of God, what God does, but David wanted to know the why, the emotions, what moved God, why did he do that? You know, why did he do that? What are the emotions of God? Why does he do this? Why does he do that? Why does he do this? Why does he all of a sudden just throw a rainbow someplace? What, why does he do that? Why does he send an angel into a room? Why does he send thousands of angels into a room? Why does he, you know, why does he do the things that he does? And it's the emotions of God's heart. God's heart literally burns with a desire for us. 
you know, for too long, it, you know, it's been taught, well, he's way up there and we're way down here, you know. He burns with desire for us. He doesn't even notice us, you know. To live fascinated, and it's to live fascinated and lovesick and overwhelmed with God's passion for us, fascinated with his beauty. And that's, you know, that's really what keeps us walking in obedience. We feel his emotions. We know his emotions. We're, in, we're friends with him. I, when you're with a friend, can you not feel their emotions? Unless you're like really out to lunch, you're in a coma. I mean, when you're sitting with somebody that you're having time with, you can feel what they're feeling. Um, and so it should be the same with us and God. We feel what he feels. And um, so he talks about, the, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I really love this. He said, when we go into that place of prayer and worship, it brings us, it, it, we can go into this place with the beauty realm, the realms of God, the glory of God. He wrote this, and I'll end this, end his, this part of his, his um, quotes with, the sustained soar that goes on and on in the beauty realm of God. The sustained soar. You shall mount up with wings as eagles. Just think about the sustained soar. We go up in worship. And we're sustained as we continue to gaze on the beauty realm of God. We go there and we remain there and we live from there. Just like from the embrace, you see, I've got a theme. You follow what I'm saying? Living in his embrace, finding that love, that rest, and walking out our day from that place of intimate communion that we establish in the morning. In that place as we praise him and thank him, we begin to, and we focus on his beauty, we begin to just... Thank you, Jesus. You're so beautiful. We begin our day with that. You know, we end our day with that. We, we focus on him. And we be, our spirit man begins to soar. And our spirit man takes first place. And then our soul gives way to the spirit man and the spirit man takes the lead. You see, you can wake up and maybe aches and pains or you're not feeling good, whatever. And at that moment, your senses and your soul are leading. But if we plug in with our spirit and focus on there, we can soar above it and establish a place where we're in the spirit and we walk our day from that place. And so I want to talk about now, um, a, you know, about Mary of Bethany. Lazarus' sister. And so we know that Mary was one of the Marys that anointed Jesus' feet. And so Mary of Bethany was at his feet anointing, kissing his feet, wiping them and washing them with her tears of love and gratitude. And the angels in the tomb, there was one at the head, there was one at the feet, places where Mary had anointed Jesus. There was adoration and there was humility. Mary Bethany and her home was the one that was being taught at his feet. Mary at the tomb, he comes to her and says, don't cling to me for I haven't yet ascended. Why did he say don't cling to me? Because those that were close to him and had this intimacy clung to him. Judas never did. He didn't have that closeness. He never knew that place. Though he was invited to the Lord's table, he never came into that intimacy. That's why he had to say, don't cling to me, because that was her first response. 
She sees him. The first thing she wants to do is cling to him. Why? Because he hadn't yet ascended. The anointing, the fellowship, the kissing of the feet, the washing with tears, the warning to cling, these were all the postures of Mary's heart and of her intimate relationship with Jesus. And you know, those should be ours. One thing I do miss, I have to say, um, shall we say in the Protestant church versus the Catholic church is the kneeling. I don't see a lot of kneeling. People sit and people stand, but there's not a lot of reverential kneeling and bowing, and I don't mean for legalistic purposes. But I was brought up with that, kneeling, people prostrate on the ground. That was normal for me to see. And I don't say that, uh, it's more of a question. I'm not condemning or pointing out or judging or accusing. And certainly I have seen it. And in many places it's very prevalent. Protestant, you follow what I'm saying? But there's a place of that adoration where we can't stand, we can't sit, we have to be on our knees or on our faces. This is a holy God. So Jesus had not yet ascended and he said, don't cling yet to me, Mary. You will be able to soon as before. But now when you cling to me, you will cling to all of my resurrection power. So when we cling to him in the spirit, we're clinging to all of his resurrection power. Cling to me. Attach yourself. Stay close. Abide. Me and you and you and me. This is what he's saying to us. Attach yourself. Stay close. Abide. Me and you and you and me. Clinging like a vine to a tree. He says, I am the tree of life. Wrap yourself around me, around and around and around, until nothing can separate you from me. For what can separate you from my life? My love, not height, nor depth, nor width, nor breadth. Nothing can separate us from his love. Absolutely nothing. The only one that can separate us from his love is ourselves. That's it. It's the only one that can separate us. And so it's like abiding in the vine, you know? So really it's a picture of like being draped like a garment around him, clinging, like literally in rest. You know what I'm saying? It's like just clinging in rest. Just I'm not even trying to like pull something from him. It's just being with him. I mean, if you have a vine, he's the vine with a branch. We're not trying to pull something. His holy sap is just coming into us as we remain. All he says is remain. Remain. In me, with me. And so these postures of Mary, I feel, are just, it's this clinging in rest, abiding and staying close in rest. I want to touch a little bit here on Psalm 27. And it's it's really God if we prepare ourselves every day from from and in waiting. It's the posture of waiting with him and in him. And um, it is learned and it is a journey forever and ever. Enoch had that journey until the Lord couldn't take it anymore and took him. We can go in, in, in deep, as deep in it as we choose to. You know, so Psalm 27, I'm just going to highlight different passages here and there. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So there's the place of resting in his light. I'm not trying to run from darkness. I rest and stay and abide in his light, in his salvation. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will know no fear. Why? Because I'm in his light. 
And being in his salvation is not just salvation of being born again. That's everything he has redeemed and saved us from. And will provide everything that's in salvation. You see, we see a word like that and we just think born again. We need to do words that we need to dig. We need to dig for the gold, what that means. That first sentence, where is that? Everything flowed from that first statement. Like the first sentence, in the beginning, in Genesis 1. Those three words, you could spend eternity enfolding those three words, what that means, and how powerful that is. And I'm not talking a theologian study. I'm talking sitting with God and with and letting him unfold it. Um, my heart will know no fear. Even if they attack me, I remain confident in him. Why? Because the Lord, this Lord of light, this Lord, this one that I know, this God of my salvation, the one who saved me, I am absolutely confident that all of these things that he's done for and before he will do again. Absolutely do again. Let's think about, I'm going to hop around here a bit, but let's just think about Mary. Mary, now we're going to the other Mary, who said, Be it done unto me according to thy, thy word and thy will, O Lord. So we know, here comes Holy Spirit, here comes the Father, here comes the Holy Spirit. And now she's got the father's sperm in her. And we know that she brings him forth and baby Jesus is born in Bethlehem. I think we need to meditate on that some more. You know why? What can God not do? What greater miracle is there in that than that? There is none. There is not one miracle that can compare when Jesus stepped out of heaven, became a seed, and was put in a woman's womb. And she brought, brought forth the Son of God. The only greater miracle than that is that he died. He laid down his life, descended into hell, ascended, rose with the keys, ascended, and is seated. You follow what I'm saying? But the whole miracle is him, of course. The miracle is him. That's the greatest miracle. His whole entire life is the greatest miracle. But you, you think about that. Just think about her. What would she have a question again that he could not do? That God could not do? After he's done that, what can he not do? I mean, you just let that sink in. Oh yeah, it's just every day God just impregnates somebody and they have a... I mean, I don't know, it's pretty astounding, really. It's pretty astounding, just like the, the, the rolled back stone and Jesus risen. Sometimes we hear stories over and over again that become familiar, and there's so much. All of heaven is in them. One thing I ask and seek, you know, he talks about delighting in his beauty, meditating in his temple. You'll conceal me when trouble comes. You'll hide me in your sanctuary. What is this? He's talking about, he's not coming from a place where he's flipping out. This is not a flipping out psalm. This is a psalm of rest. This is a psalm of confidence. This is a psalm of trust and hope. He hides us. He'll hide me. He places me out of reach on a high rock. He holds my head high. I mean, all of these things, I'll offer sacrifices with shouts of joy, with singing, with praise, with music. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me, and I, my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. What is talking about their friendship, holy dialogue, a place of walking in rest from this place of intimacy, from this place of closeness. Even if my father and mother abandon me, here we go, the Lord will hold me close. There it is again. The constant theme of his desire to be close with us. And David knew that. He wrote of what he knew. 
He wrote of what he experienced, and he wrote of what he was revealed. And yet he goes on to say, yet I am confident. He goes on, you know, if this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Yet I am confident that I will see the Lord's goodness. Well, I am here in the land of the living. And that goodness equals glory in the land of the living. Everything of God's goodness, everything, every single thing of God's goodness, he was confident that he would see in the land of the living. And he says, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Wait patiently for the Lord. And that was his secret. He knew how to wait and be with the Lord. Just be with him. There is nothing, in my opinion, that is really more important to pursue than this place of waiting and must be established in rest. So I just have a, just a little bit more. So, there was a song years ago. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember who, who's, who wrote it, who sang it right now. Um, Tom, I can see his name, um, it's called Paradise is Waiting. And this is the words to the song. Preparing our hearts to worship. Prepare my heart to see you. Prepare my heart to know you. Prepare my heart to love you. In brokenness I come to you, prepare my heart. In weakness, I praise you, prepare my heart. I offer you myself, O Lord. Broken and contrite, weak and weary, O Lord, I offer you all that I am. A broken vessel, O Lord. Fill me, O Lord, with your glory, with your glory. Let me hear the sound of heaven singing. Let me hear the sound of heaven rejoicing. Oh, let me hear your heart of love beating for me, oh Lord, in the stillness, in the quiet. Let me hear your heart of love beating for me in the stillness, in the quiet. You see, when we begin to lose the rhythm of life, we need to be still. Lay our head on his breast as John did and hear his heart of love beating just for you. In the stillness, in the quiet. Waiting, Jean Guyon wrote, is the highest activity of the will. You know, I found it interesting, um, so I've been studying a little bit of Jean Guyon again. I did not know this, that John Wesley, of course this is a Methodist church, John Wesley, that we're using, you know, in this building, John Wesley transcribed her first two books from French into English and brought it to the Methodist Church and I never knew that. And her teachings rocked the world, as we know, and are still rocking the world. What she went through her life Three years in prison, moved from that, four years of solitary confinement, not one visitor in four years. She had one little window, tiny little window that she could get a glimpse of the daylight and a glimpse of a star or two for four years. In a damp, cold, freezing cell in the winter, in boiling heat in the winter, in that cell, she lost her health. When they finally released her, she was exiled 
to a town called Boys, B-O-I-S. And for the rest of her life, she lived there. She lived 15 more years. And from that, she penned the rest of her books. From that, she penned letters to people all over the world and responded to people everywhere and taught them the secret of living in and from God's presence in the realms of communion, in the depths and the mysteries and stewarding the mysteries of intimacy. She transformed people's lives. I could name the names. Famous men and women books and Wesley was one of them, and I never knew that. I knew of others, but I didn't know him. And that he was actually the one that transposed it from French to English to bring it into the Methodist Church. That was very, I was really moved by that. Anyways, so she also wrote this, the main element of the soul is the will, and the soul must, the soul must will to become neutral and passive waiting entirely upon God. She writes this, Can you not see this condition of utter passivity? This state of doing nothing and waiting upon God is the highest activity of the will. Listen to your soul as it says, I am willing with all the power of my being that the desire of God be accomplished within me. I am willing to be here, ceasing from all activity and all of my power so that God might have his desire of fully possessing me. When the soul has done this, it has actually exerted the highest possible action of the will. The soul that has taken the action of total surrender to another's will, the divine will. There's two wills in play at all times. Our free will that he has given us, it will never take away, and his divine will. And to come into this realm that she learned to live in, and those who know the secret places of God, it's surrendering our free will. And we wait. Being with him is what gives him the greatest pleasure. Not what we do for him, just so we get that straight. It's being with him then we do for him. And we actually don't do it for him. We actually do it with him. Because once we're with him, then we move through our day with him. That's how he created it. The very way that he walked in the garden with Adam is how he wants to walk with us. He walks with us and yet he's in us. It's a mystery. So she writes this, give all of your attention to learning how to turn within and dwell in your spirit. And that literally means your spirit takes the lead. So it forms a, form a habit of continually returning to God who is your center with a peaceful, tender love. So what does that mean? I have one more thing I'm going to share here that I wrote. What does that mean? That means that that which we establish when we wait with him He is the plumb line. He is everything. We're, we're literally aligned. Our whole being is centered and aligned on him. And I'm not talking some new age thing that they try to steal from us. We're aligned our spirit with him. 
We come into a union and a communion. We wait there. And when that's established, as we go throughout our day, if we start to get pulled up, we can reestablish it in a moment. You can feel when you're getting pulled out of rest. You can feel when you're getting pulled out of communion. He really wants us to live our lives from this place of imperfect rest. Now you can say, well, that's impossible. No, it's not. He said that we could because by his spirit we can't. We can't on our own. You can't make yourself do this. This is found with him, waiting on him. And so... You know, you could say, well, our day is just, you know, it's not like in those days. Our days are just so busy. Blah, 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 blah. But you know what? I wonder about that. They had to get up before when it would dawn. They had to milk their cows. They had to grow their, their vegetables. They, uh, every, they had to make and create everything. If they wanted bread, they, 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 had, they wanted milk, they had to milk. I mean, what, everything that they had, they had to make it. Pick it, grow it, make their clothes. Well, I go buy my clothes. I mean, think about it. And then it would get dark. And everything was done by a little candle. You know, and everything had to be handwritten. I mean, however they, I mean, it's just when you think about it. We have things that make it go faster, but that time is filled with more stuff. So as I, I'll end with this, and Cherish, I would like to end with that, that song, please, after I, so you can get, go over and just be prepared as I read this. Actually, yeah, why don't you go there and just play something quietly. I just want to wait for a minute before I read this, because then we'll go right into it. Now obviously I'm not teaching or sharing this is if I'm walking in perfect rest. But I'll tell you what, it's a goal for me. I, I, and, I, and I say perfect rest because he said that we could have perfect rest. Just like he said we could have perfect love because perfect love, his perfect love casts out all fear. You know, one thing I was reading and I was just doing some reading on healing, and divine healing, and Jesus the healer, in the realms of the spirit and healing. And one of the things that Kenyon wrote about Jesus the healer, he talked about the mystery of rest deep within our being, this rest that comes from waiting this rest that comes from walking and being with him. And he talks about this rest, when that rest is deeply established in us. Disease and sickness begin to go. Perfect rest is really sickness in our bodies comes because something's out of sync, something's off, whether it's spiritually, something's off, a weakened organ, we're not going to get into things of why and whatever and all the reasons for sickness. I want to focus on the antidote, the cure how we begin to have it dislodge itself in its perfect rest. Perfect rest. But we're aligned in an intimacy with the Lord. Think about it. He was never sick. He walked in perfect love and he walked in perfect rest and he was never sick. And don't. And he walked as a man. He 
God at every gate with perfect rest and perfect love. So I'm just going to read this which I wrote, waiting with him. I have access by your blood to not just touch your robe, the hem of your garment, but to cling to you, the resurrected King, clinging to trusting in, relying on your reality, resurrection's reality. You had not yet ascended. Mary, don't cling to me, you said. But you have, and you are ascended and seated in total, full rest. You accomplished all you were sent for, came for, and now you are seated on the throne of all dominion, authority, power, in perfect rest. I cling to you in love. Your perfect rest, it flows into my being, establishing your divine rest in my spirit, soul, and body. Perfect rest and perfect peace. Clinging to I am the resurrection and the life. Circumstances to not reign over me, for I am seated in and with, I am. His divine rest rules my life. I live in and from rest. I breathe in perfect peace. It transforms my being. Walking with the Prince of Peace, guiding every thought, decision, and step. The realm of rest. He is seated in victory. He is not moved. He is Lord of all. I am seated in him and with him. I will not be moved. He is Lord of all. I will live in and from over the overflow, the John 10, 10 abundant overflowing life. I cling to abundance. He purchased abundant life. He is abundant life. I cling, remain, trust in, rely on your abundant overflow in and within me. The overflow of rest and divine provision already mine, for I am yours, purchased with you. So Lord, cause us, Holy Spirit, bring us, teach us, guide us, lead us into perfect rest. Cause us to live in and from the abundant overflow of rest in your divine provision. Seated with you and in you, that we would not be moved we would live in and from the realm of rest. That is my prayer for my life. That is my prayer for all of us.